Well then, everybody, I actually had someone um, from the UK uh, who prompted me with this question. Uh, it's a pretty quick one to answer. I know, thank goodness, because I ramble on. Um, but anyway, they asked me what's my opinion on trans feminine people having low testosterone levels, uh, or what do I consider low, you know, just kind of talk about that. So, you know, with my practice anyway, I usually aim uh, with trans feminine people who are on like full dose therapy or, you know, like they want full feminization, you know, everything estrogen can do for them uh, is what they're going for. Uh, I'm usually going to aim somewhere below uh, 60 NGDL for testosterone levels. Um, that can vary depending on their goals and everything. I've talked about this in other videos, you know, higher testosterone levels, maybe to like 100, 150 or so, may maintain a better libido, energy levels, stuff like that. But in general, the cisgender ranges for uh, cisgender women are going to run somewhere between about 5 to 60 NGDL on testosterone. So, um, so that's what we aim for. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of trans feminine people end up with testosterone levels that aren't even measurable. Like, it'll just say, like, less than 3 or less than 0.2 or, you know, something like that on the labs, meaning it's just not a sufficient quantity to be measured even uh, by that lab's uh, instruments. And so, is this a good thing or not? So, here's how I approach it. Not saying anyone has to do this by any means. Um, initially, for the first maybe one to two years, I don't so much worry about it unless someone starts to report symptoms of low testosterone. And I don't mean the symptoms that, you know, cisgender men report with low testosterone. Not that. I mean symptoms that cisgender women would report with low testosterone. Because clearly you're going to have a difference from what your baseline testosterone used to be somewhere between like 350 to 900 in GDL, and then we drop it to below 60. That's going to cause <laughs> some uh, differences. Uh, but if your testosterone level is like less than 5, uh, then, and you're a cisgender woman or a transgender woman or transgender person, trans feminine person, what can happen? The most common complaint is going to be super low energy levels uh, and then like a brain fog that you didn't used to have. I should mention that because I get brain fog anyway. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about transient stuff where like, oh, occasionally I feel a little just like in the head. Uh, I mean like a persistent brain fog. You just can't function and there's just no other cause for this, you know, because of course lots of things can cause similar problems, you know, poor nutrition, high stress levels, you know, and it's not like the trans community is not stressed, right? <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so if there's literally nothing else going on that has changed that could be causing this kind of brain fog, maybe look at, uh, you know, what your testosterone level is. Is it super low? Um, long term, this can have uh, more detrimental effects. Uh, on bone and brain health, you know, especially like bone maintenance, you do need both hormones in certain quantities, at least certain minimal quantities to help maintain your bone strength, bone density, bone health. Uh, and so testosterone is an important hormone to monitor in trans feminine uh, hormone therapy, not just because we want to see it go down, but also because we need it to be a certain level uh, to maintain certain uh, physiologic aspects of the body in good health. Uh, but for the first one to two years, uh, unless someone develops, like I said, symptoms, they start complaining of extreme fatigue for no reason, brain fog, whatnot, um, if they're asymptomatic, then I usually won't start addressing it for about one or two years just because it does seem like 
not messing with that does help people progress further with those changes in those first couple of years with puberty 2.0 so to speak um not to say that having a somewhat higher testosterone level you know would impede it but i will say that this is a very difficult thing to balance appropriately and with where my clinic is located, we don't have a lot of people that have like a lot of disposable cash or great health insurance coverage that's gonna allow us to do fast and frequent lab work to check and see where things are. So this is one of those choices made by necessity uh, of what the resources are around us. Uh, in a perfect world, um, within the first six months or so, I would detect that there is a low testosterone level that's lower than what I would recommend for the long term, and we would address it by having a very minimal uh, testosterone supplementation. Sounds funny, right? Testosterone supplementation in a trans feminine individual, but it is necessary many times. <clears throat> While some people probably, I don't know, a good half, maybe a little bit more than half of my patients are able to um, maintain their testosterone within a good range between 5 and 60 or a little bit higher uh, so that we don't have to worry about this. A good chunk of them don't. And then some of them kind of bounce up and down between it, um, you know, and that's just, you know, kind of them. <laughs> And sometimes it has to do with, uh, you know, a person keeps changing therapy from pills to injections to patches to whatever. And so it's hard to get a bead on where exactly something is at one point in time. But, you know, so there's a decent portion of folks who consistently have uh, lower than 5 NGDL of testosterone, probably around, I don't know, 15 20% maybe at the upper limit, um, who are folks that eventually, either at the end of the one or two year mark, I'm going to say, hey, this is what these labs will mean for the long term, and here are the options um, for supplementation, or you know, you can always try to lower the estradiol dose, or if you happen to be one of the few people who do require testosterone blockers, perhaps, you know, either coming off of them or significantly reducing their dose or whatnot. A lot of variables here, uh, but we can kind of play with the dosing of the medication to see if we can get testosterone to come up. Um, this is not always possible, unfortunately. Um, you know, sometimes if I have someone, say, for example, on solo estrogen therapy, meaning we're only on estrogen and it is causing their body to suppress their own testosterone production. So let's say we've got someone with injections on estrogen and they've got a 200 estradiol level at trough. Okay, 200 pgml just for reference because other countries are out there listening to me. So 200 pgml of estradiol valerate injections um, and this is drawn at trough and their testosterone level is fully suppressed uh, and it is less than 5 uh, NGDL for testosterone. Um, we could play with the dosing uh, and the timing of the dose, the frequency of the dose uh, of, the, of the injections and see if that will allow testosterone to kind of creep back up to a certain point. Um, but some people, their testosterone is suppressed so easily by even the most minuscule introduction of estrogen into their system that this is just not possible. We could reduce their dose down to where their trough uh, of their estradiol is 50 and their testosterone is still steadily staying less than 5. Uh, and in these cases, it is necessary then to talk about supplementation with a very low dose testosterone, usually going to be testosterone cream. Um, that's the most readily available 
kind of um, testosterone supplementation. There are other forms, but this is going to be the more readily available, the more affordable, certainly. Um, <clears throat> though you do have the option of doing testosterone injections. Uh, this, <laughs> talking people into doing yet more injections. Not much of a thing, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and this is not a medication that you can mix, so you can't mix like your testosterone and your estrogen together and give it in the same shot, unfortunately, or else that would be super. Um, but anyway, so usually it's going to be a topical form of testosterone that you're going to supplement with. Um, very low dose, uh, probably going to be like uh, here uh, where I'm at in the southeast of the United States, uh, probably going to be somewhere between four to eight milligrams uh, of testosterone in a cream applied per day. Um, it, you know, if we're needing to do that. Uh, and then, like I said, some people doing the adjusting of their estradiol injection dose or lengthening the time in between injections can sometimes allow the testosterone to come up on its own. But like I said, some people's just will not, or some people's will be able to exceed what our goals are. And no matter what we try, it's just, it's either going to be fully suppressed or it's going to be above 200 on their testosterone level, which is not generally something that trans feminine people are looking for because you can have a lot of like masculinizing effects then whenever it's over 200 it's harder for the estradiol to kind of battle so to speak uh, the effects of testosterone at that point um, but anyway so yes testosterone levels are important to keep an eye on um, especially if they are very low uh, and then Playing with dosing and whatnot is usually the first thing that I will do uh, just to see if we can kind of get things going a little bit easier uh, than adding in yet another medication. But if not, then we will talk about potentially supplementing. Of course, it is always up to the patient whether they want to supplement, but I will thoroughly educate and counsel them on, uh, you know, the effects of not having sufficient testosterone. Certainly there are people who go through life with super low testosterone levels, cis women and every, everything, excuse me. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, and, and they're not keeling over or anything, but the potential for problems is there. Uh, so anyway, with that thought, do monitor your testosterone levels, um, you know, and, uh, and see if there's something you can do with them. Uh, I would not obsess over them, certainly, but it is something to discuss with your healthcare provider uh, at some point in time to make sure that you are both on board with monitoring your overall general health and not just hyper-focusing on, you know, just getting this one part of puberty 2.0 like I just want my testosterone crushed and just just nothing forever no nah, it's not the best way to do it it's a good upfront uh, way to look at things to get it just down and whatever but later you do need to evaluate okay is this good for the long term um, and like I said uh, where I'm located in the southeast it's very difficult whenever we start talking about this because it requires a good bit of lab work to evaluate, okay, we changed the dose of your estradiol. Let's see what your levels are. Well, they're not quite there yet. Okay, let's change it again. Now we got to repeat labs. Or, you know, if we add in testosterone cream, now we got to check, okay, did we get it right? Is it a little bit too high? Okay, adjust the dose. Is it a little bit too low still? not absorbing it well. Okay, adjust the dose up and then repeat labs. Like I said, it's very involved whenever you're trying to balance these hormones appropriately. Uh, and so this can get very costly then uh, for folks who are paying out of pocket or who are DIY and just doing it on their own. Um, and possibly even if you have health insurance, it's no guarantee that health insurance will cover this or that you'll have, you know, free, so to speak, uh, lab work, you may have to pay a pretty hefty copay for labs. Um, 
So anyway, so it is something to be aware of. Uh, and definitely uh, within the first couple years of hormone therapy is something that does need to be evaluated. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, it gave me a good idea for a video when I was kind of sitting here just staring into space wondering what I should talk about. Huh. Anyway, hope that helps someone out there. See y'all later. Bye.